Hey YouTube, welcome back to the shop and another Blades to Be video. Don't have a project today, even have a clean hat on today since we're probably not going to get very dirty. But I had another request to talk a little bit about some of the tooling that I use, some of the tooling I would recommend if you're setting up a new lathe. So we're going to go through today and we're going to do that. Going to break the tooling up into three different sections. We're going to talk about work holding, so we're going to talk about what tooling for the headstock. We're going to talk about tailstock items, so support tooling, drill chucks, and then we're going to talk about the actual cutting tooling, so things that are going to be in your tool post and on the carriage itself. So we'll break it up into those three sections. If you look in the description for the video, I will make sure I put the time jumps in there. So if you want to jump to one of those three sections, you'll be able to find a link to do that in the description for the YouTube video. And before we jump into the content, hey, again, appreciate all the feedback we're getting on the channel. If you like the videos, please hit that subscribe button. Working to get videos out every week. Right now, I'm shooting for every Saturday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. My goal is to get a video out there. You can watch that when you're having that first cup of coffee before you get out in your shop, and you can check out what's been going on in the Blades to Be shop the week before. I may get some videos out there earlier than that as well, so please subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, and that way you're always going to know when a video is being released. So let's go ahead and we're going to just go around the shop. I'm going to show you a little bit about where I store some of my tooling, how it's put together, where I store it on the lathe, and then we're going to lay it all out on the bench and go through all the tooling in those three different sections. So let's head over and uh, let's check out the shop a little bit on where everything is stored. For my lathe tooling, I have that stored on this tool tray that I built. And I have most of my tailstock items down there at one end of the tray. And then I have most of my quick change tooling sort of organized up there on top. I've got my facing and turning holders here near the front, threading tooling over there, most of my boring bars lined up over there, and then my parting insert. So I sort of have that broken into sections on my tool tray. Keep my oil up there. That's my center drills that I keep in the little pill bottle. Chuck wrench is just on a magnet there. So that's how I keep that organized. And then moving over to the headstock, there's a couple of things that I just consistently keep on my headstock. I typically always have my smaller lathe file up there. I have a level. I use that for setting up my boring bars. I always keep a pair of pliers for pulling chips out of the way. I have my little brush for, again, sweeping chips out of the way. A tape measure, calculator, and my little stick that I have there for typically catching parts that I part off. I also use that to clean the chips out of the front of my lathe. So straight across from the lathe, in the bottom drawer of this toolbox, I have my two chuck cradles, so make it easy to move my three and four jaw chuck around on the ways, get those lined up, and get those changed out. So those are down in that drawer. All right, let's take a look at where I store most of my machining equipment. Uh, as others have shown in some of their videos, this Husky cabinet from Home Depot, very affordable, very economical cabinet. It holds a lot of weight. It has nice sized drawers. They're ball bearing, the drawers each hold a lot of weight, so this has been a great cabinet. In this top drawer is where I have most of my measuring equipment. I've got some digital calipers, I've got some larger micrometers, some larger calipers, you know, my inside micrometer, telescopic gauges, and honestly, most of this equipment I have had for over 30 years from when I was machining full time, and I'm thankful that I still have it. Uh, I have yet to use my five to six inch micrometer. I'm not machining things that large at the moment. But again, I'm very happy that I still have this equipment for when I need it. This next drawer is all about drilling. We've got a full set of drill bits, precision twist drill, uh, some leftover oddball size drill bits, some taps here in the back, and my larger drill bits. So if I'm getting started that I need to bore a hole in something, then I've got some larger drill bits that will fit in the tailstock of the lathe. We'll talk a little bit about more about those when we get to the tailstock section. Next drawer down is just some scrap metal and material. And then the next drawer down is my inserts and all of my insert tooling for the different boring bars. Just some leftover boxes from the, the live centers that I have. And this big drawer down at the bottom is where I have the full 5C collet set to go with that Atlas collet chuck that we will talk about more here in a few moments. Shifting over to the other side, most everything on this side of the toolbox is for milling. I do have a couple of drawers with some lathe tools in them. So I do have the steady rest and the follower rest from the lathe are in this drawer. Those just came with the machine. And then down in the bottom drawer is where I keep the chucks that are not in use. So right now I've got the four jaw chuck and that Atlas collet chuck in there. 
when the three jaw is not in use, it's going to take the place of one of these and be in this drawer. So that's where everything is stored. Let's go ahead and get this laid out on the bench where it's going to be a little bit easier to talk about it. And then we'll go through those three different sections that we talked about up front. All right, before we get going on the tools, I just wanted to take a moment and show this tool tray. Unfortunately, I did not make a video of this when I made it. I made this when the lathe first arrived. And it is just one and a quarter inch angle iron, bevel cut on the ends, put together like a picture frame. It has a piece of uh, sheet metal for the bottom. And I just made those clamps that are on there. Try and get a good look at those. There we go. These clamps, it's just a piece of two inch square tubing, quarter inch wall. And I went over to the milling machine, cut a notch out of those, and then welded a nut in there to the inside. So we've got a nut welded on the inside, and then just have a bolt going through that. There's a piece of aluminum shim stock up underneath, and another piece of aluminum shim that it, the tray is sitting on, and it's just being sandwiched in there. So basically just three little homemade C-clamps under there. And there's just a couple of pieces of half-inch rod welded onto that to make the chuck key holders. Some rubber tubing on there, actually rubber left over from my wiring of the VFD, just some of the electrical wire coating. So that's what's on there for the chuck key holders. And then just a four by four wooden block there with some holes drilled in it for holding live centers and chucks, etc. So that's all that's going on there. Pretty easy job to make one. And I know there's been some other videos out there of tool trays to put on your splash guard, but it has definitely worked out well for me. Let's go ahead and start talking about all this different lathe tooling that we have here. We're going to break it down by the sections we talked about. So we'll start with our work holding tooling, starting at the headstock. Then we'll jump back to our tailstock tooling. And then we'll finish up with our cutting tools. Tool holders, quick change tool holders, inserts, etc. All right, let's go ahead and get started on that headstock. So looking at the headstock, first thing we'll talk about is the three jaw chuck that should come standard on pretty much any lathe that you purchase. And that is gonna be your go-to workhorse chuck that you will use a large amount of the time. Worked full time as a machinist for years, spent a lot of time doing work in a three jaw chuck, does everything you're gonna need it to do. I know there's always conversations that uh, four jaw chuck is more accurate, three jaw chuck is not as accurate. Just wanna give at least my understanding and my explanation of what that means when you're thinking about accuracy of a three jaw chuck. And to me, what that means is the repeatability. Once you put a piece in your three jaw chuck and you turn it round, then that piece is gonna be as round as your spindle bearings on your lathe are able to turn a piece. The only time the inaccuracy of a three jaw chuck comes into play is as soon as you undo that chuck, you remove your piece, you try to put it immediately back in there, and there is a low probability that is gonna be running perfectly concentric to where it was when you just took it out. So when people talk about the accuracy of a three jaw chuck, it's that repeatability to be able to take a piece out, put it back in. For example, if you're making a part, you need to turn one end of it and drill a hole, bore that, and you need those to be concentric, and then you need to take that piece out of the chuck, turn it around, and maybe bore from the backside or machine a step on the backside. You are not going to be able to do that with a three jaw chuck and expect that holes in that outer surface on the backside to be concentric with the outer surface and the holes you just made on the front side. If you want to do something like that where you need to take a part out, or if you have a part that was already machined previously and you are now just remachining a surface on it, maybe a, a surface got welded up and you're just machining one surface and you need that to be concentric with the other surfaces, that is when you're gonna need to go to the four jaw chuck. So again, the four jaw chuck, each of the four jaws moves independently and you are able to dial in your piece to make sure that it is running true with a surface or other surfaces that are 
already exist on that piece. The way you're gonna dial that in, you have dial indicators. I know when I was going through the toolbox, I didn't show the dial indicators. Those are if you have a four jaw chuck, or really, if you're gonna have a lathe, at some point you're probably gonna need a dial indicator. So those are very important pieces in that work setup process, uh, which you're gonna be doing on the headstock. Moving on from the four jaw chuck, I also have this 5C collet chuck. Again, I worked as a machinist for years and never used a collet chuck when I was working as a machinist. Now that I have this Atlas hand chuck, I love it. And it does have better accuracy than the three jaw chuck. So if I need to take something out, put it back in and move it, it has very, very good. I mean, the run out on it when I put a piece back in is within a couple of tenths, as opposed to the three jaw chuck, the run out is typically uh, two to three thousandths of an inch when I'm putting something back in and out of that. So collet chuck, I love it. I have a full set of 5C collets. You saw that in the drawer when we went through the toolbox. There's a couple of the collets there and you can spin those by hand, pull it out of the chuck, put a new one in. I'll demo that here in just a second and you can get a look at that. Where did these items come from? That three jaw chuck came with the lathe from Precision Matthews. I ordered that four jaw chuck with my lathe from Precision Matthews as well. That Atlas hand wheel speed collet chuck I purchased from Grizzly and a lot of times you can find a 10% off coupon or something at grizzly.com. Maybe a great place to make a purchase if you need that. For dial indicators, I have a Noga base. I've been very happy with it for the, my magnetic base. I've had a tech lock head on that and used tech lock heads for years. I've had good success with them. For my smaller, a little bit more precision dial there. That one is a Mitsutoyo. And again, I use that a lot on the milling machine for setups. I will use that on the lathe for dialing in the face of something as well. The two chucks are sitting on chuck cradles, chuck caddies, and those I just made out of four by fours, stuck them in the milling machine and turned that radius in there with a boring head. Makes it a lot easier for taking the chucks on and off the lathe, gives them a, a caddy to, to put that in. You do not want to be dropping a chuck onto your ways. So if you don't have a fitted chuck caddy, make sure you at least put some boards, put some plywood, put something across your bed anytime you're changing a chuck to make sure that you don't have something drop down on there and ding up your ways. That is a good way to wreck your day right there. So that's what's going on at the headstock. Let me demo pulling a collet out and putting a collet in on this Atlas chuck real quick. Again, this is just a hand wheel. So when it's in the lathe or out of the lathe, you're just spinning this hand wheel. There we go, that's loose. You pull that out. They have a keyway on them. Make sure you know where the keyway is. Line that up, push that in. And then you're gonna just hand wheel and draw that back into the chuck again. Great accuracy on that as you're moving a piece back and forth. Great repeatability, putting a piece into that collet chuck. One other thing I wanna point out with these collet chucks is just how smooth they are. They really don't have edges, they don't have jaw edges sticking out when they're spinning. So a lot of times when you're in a collet chuck, you're doing small work, small diameter work. You're in there with the file, emery cloth, etc. And these are much smaller in diameter, a lot less mass coming around. Some of the other designs that are out there uh, don't even have this hand wheel in the way. They're going to have a very smooth surface, very similar in diameter to probably what uh, this backing plate is on this one. And they're operated with a chuck key, like a three or a four jaw chuck. So again, just a lot of great options out there. And I've only used this Atlas. This is the only one I can give you feedback on. I've been happy with it, but lots of other reviews of some other collet chucks online. And they, a lot of them have the same benefits features of this one in just a little bit different package. So that's just something else to consider with a collet chuck. And one thing before we leave the headstock is make sure you understand what kind of chuck mounting you have for your lathe. There's several different options out there when it comes to how your chuck is going to mount onto your headstock. For this lathe, it's D16, and that is referring to the diameter, the spacing of these cam locks, the number of cam locks that you have. Some chucks don't use cam locks at all. They have threading, they have other taper configurations. So again, if you're gonna order any new tooling for your lathe, you need to make sure you understand what that mounting is for your particular lathe. You'll also notice, don't notice it on the four jaw, but on this three jaw, you'll notice that there is a back plate. So the backing plate on that, oftentimes you can buy a chuck and you can unscrew the chuck from the backing plate 
and you could potentially purchase a new backing plate that would mount for your lathe's mounting configuration and then you may still be able to use the chuck on that new mounting bracket that does fit on your lathe. So some different options as you're looking for new chucks, new tooling to go on your headstock. Just make sure you understand the mounting and if you're looking at new tooling, looking at new chucks, you just know whether you have a backing plate, need to buy a backing plate, keep all that in mind so you know what you're getting yourself into. Let's move on to the tailstock. Looking at the tailstock, that's where you're going to have your support tooling and drilling, reaming, anything like that. Tapping, power tapping is going to happen from the tailstock. So that's what you're looking for tool holders for for that. Just like we mentioned with the headstock, you need to understand how that is mounted for your lathe. You'll want to make sure you know how these are mounted for your tailstock as well. My lathe has a number four Morse taper, so the tang on all my tooling for the tailstock is going to have a number four Morse taper. Or if you find something with a smaller taper, you can buy sleeves and adapters to be able to get that up to the right size. Now, most lathes are going to come with a dead center. That's what I'm holding right here. And what that means by a dead center is that this is a, essentially a solid piece of steel. This one happens to have a carbide tip, but it's still solid in the fact that it does not spin. It is going to go into the taper on that tailstock and nothing on this is going to spin. So if you put a piece of steel on this that has a center hole in it, so if you put a piece of steel on here that has a center hole in it, so here's just a small little piece of the center hole, it's going to go on that and it's going to turn, but this center is not. So you're going to be turning that fast on a lathe. You need to make sure you put some oil on this dead center and eventually that's going to generate some heat. That is a part that's actually this part's going to spin. That's a part that's spinning and against something else that's not moving, it's going to generate some heat, generate some friction, and you potentially lose a little bit of accuracy if you get any wear on this part. For anybody who's doing a significant amount of machining, you are probably going to want to invest in a live center. So with this live center, you're going to put your piece on there and this has ball bearings in it and now this center is going to turn and it's going to turn with your piece. So there's connection right here and all that friction, everything is happening inside of this and with, against ball bearings and it can handle a lot of speed. You're not gonna generate heat. You don't lose any accuracy off the tip. So you're gonna to wanna to invest in a live center. This particular live center came from Grizzly, was a recommendation I got from somebody else. Uh, I put it to use. It has worked well for me so far. That center is a little bit large and sometimes that gets in the way when you're trying to work. So in addition to that one, I have this long nose center, lets you get into a little bit tighter places and it's just exactly what it says. It's just a long nose, but it is still live. It's still turning with your piece. So the last center that I have is this bull nose center. And again, just exactly what it says. It's a bull nose. This is also a live center. I had a job with, uh, if you may have seen the other videos, machine some hubs. And originally my plan was when I was gonna bore all the way through those hubs and turn it around and need to be able to hold those on center while I rough the outside, uh, I ended up not boring all the way through and was able to just still just use a regular center on the back of those. But that's what I had that for. Otherwise you're using this for a pipe. If you needed to turn a long section of pipe, these other centers are not gonna be big enough to get into the middle of a piece of pipe. This, you would be able to put a bevel on that piece of pipe and put it on this bull nose center. And again, give that support if you're turning a long piece. So that's the support you have in your tailstock. For cutting in the tailstock, primarily gonna be using drill chucks for most of your holding in the tailstock. So I have one keyless chuck that I use. This one came from Glasser and Machine Tools, company online. I bought a milling machine vise from them and another keyless chuck for my mill. Very happy with the, the quality of these. It's on ball bearings, very smooth, nice jaws, good accuracy on that. And then in addition to that keyless chuck, I have one regular keyed chuck. This is actually a leftover from my milling machine. This is the chuck that came with my milling machine. I just took it off of the R8 uh, Arbor that it was on and I purchased this MT4 Arbor to put it on and it gives me a chance to have two different drill chucks on my lathe. Quite often, I will leave this one set up with a center drill in it and that way I can quickly center drill items and then maybe leave something else set up in the other chuck and it's a little bit easier to change. So on that note, You'll want to have a variety of center drills. They come in a variety of different sizes. And for the reason that you would expect, you want a couple of different sizes of your center drills so that if you have a very small piece, you're able to put a very small hole in the end of that, put your center in that to, uh, to hold it, and go up to the larger 
you, know, you essentially want to put in the largest size center drill that you can to get the most support out of your work. When you're drilling in for your center drill, recommendation is you go about two thirds of the way up on this center drill and want to make sure you don't get too far. If you go past that, then you're losing accuracy. You may uh, you know, get run out. It may leave a lip in there and then your center isn't going to connect properly. So you want to make sure that you don't go past the step. So go about two thirds of the way on any size center drill. That's about where you go into before you put your live or your dead center into that hole that you just created. So after you've got your center drill in there for support, you may also need to drill holes in your workpiece. So I just have a standard drill index here. This one came from Precision Twist Drill. Have drill bits all the way from 1 16th up to half an inch. And that covers most everything for me. I do have a one inch drill bit if I need to go, if I'm boring a hole out, uh, anything between half inch and that one inch, I would just need to bore anything in between. And if I have a larger project where I need to bore a large size hole in it, then I do have this one and a quarter inch drill to be able to quickly get up to that one and a quarter inch size and be able to use my largest boring bar to bore quickly after that. The smaller the boring bar, the lighter the cut you need to take. We'll talk more about that when we look at the tooling here in a moment. So if you're making a two or a three inch hole, you want to try to drill as big as you can. This was kind of my trade-off in cost effectiveness. Um, this was a pretty you know, reasonably priced drill bit uh, to get out to one and a quarter and let me use that largest boring bar to get going there. There are other pieces. I do not currently have a specialized tap holder or a die holder. There's some other great tools. There's floating reamer holders you can get for your tailstock. Right now I'm doing most everything with what you see here on the table. Using my drill chucks for most of the reaming. Depending on the accuracy you need, you may need to get some other specialized tools for your tailstock as well. But that's kind of what's going on at the tailstock, so let's move our way over to the other cutting tools. Let's move on to the bread and butter of the lathe, which is your cutting tools. That is what you're going to be doing the majority of your metal removal with, your material removal with, is the cutting tools. So before we get into all the individual tools, let's talk a little bit about your tool holders. What came with this lathe was this four position tool post. So it's nice, you can actually spin it and it locks into uh, every 45 degrees, it locks, or every 90 degrees, sorry, it locks into position. So it has four different places where it stops. You can put up to four tools on here. You can turn it, it'll lock into place. It's got a little indexing pin that is up underneath. And again, you can put four different tools on here, change them out. It's pretty quick to change a tool, moving it on the top. Probably the biggest disadvantage of this tool post is every time you change a tool, it's going to be in a different position. Let me find an example of that. So every time you change a tool, even if this was a carbide insert or anything else, every time you put it in, you're gonna bolt it in slightly different. Even if you push it up against the edge, you'll never get the length of it out there just perfect. So that's why it's not considered a quick change tool post when it comes to changing out multiple tools because your tool will go on in a different location. Most people who, again, are gonna be getting into using a lathe, quick change tool posts are very, very popular right now. So let's take a look at what that gives you. So with this quick change tool post, now you have the ability to have a tool that is set up. You can have this so that it's gonna be set up on height. You have a height adjustment here. And every time you wanna change your tools, you drop that into place, it drops onto the right height, it's already clamped in, so it's going to be the exact same distance out from your tool post. So as long as you have not actually moved your tool post anywhere on your compound, then you'll be able to take a tool off, put another one on, perform a machining operation, take that off, put another tool on, and know that it will be back into the same place it was when it was on there previous to the last machining operation. So that gives you great repeatability, and that's why it's called a quick change tool post. The biggest disadvantage I had when I first received this quick change tool post is that anytime I wanted to turn it to change the direction of it, there was a nut on top of this. So I made this speed nut, I made this handle on top so that now I can use this lever to quickly change tools and I can use this lever to undo it and turn it around to do that. Now, obviously, if you turn it, then you don't have that repeatability if you just performed a machining operation. But a lot of times I really do want to be able to change an angle, quickly put a bevel on something or do another operation. So I really like having the ability to quickly do this without having to grab a wrench. You can watch one of my other videos on making that 
quick change tool post speed nut. The uh, link to that will be in the description for this video if you're interested in making those parts new levers. So regardless of which tool holder you end up with, whether you have a quick change tool post or whether you have the four-way tool post that came on your lathe, doesn't matter which one of those you have, you are going to be using a similar variety of tooling to be able to do that. Whether that's indexable tooling, whether that's tooling that you grind yourself, parting tools, boring tools, you're going to be performing some of the same operations. So before we get into the individual tools that I have here on the table, let me just talk about a little bit about what was my overarching goal when I tried to pick out tooling. I knew that I wanted to get into a quick change tool post, and I knew that I wanted to get into indexable tooling, so I did plan to use carbide inserts for the majority of my machining operations. But with that, I'm still just a hobby shop. I mean, I get to do some business on the side. I have some jobs coming in. But I tried to really minimize the number of different inserts that I needed to purchase. So I tried to pick tool holders and pick tooling that was going to minimize the number of different kinds of inserts that I had. Because inserts is where the cost can go up pretty high. Tool holders are expensive, buying inserts are expensive. The number, the more different tool holders you have, the more different types of inserts you have, that's where the price is going to go up. So with that said, I have primarily three different inserts for the majority of all the tooling that you see here on the table. I have one boring bar that has a smaller insert just because it is so much smaller. We'll talk about that when we get there. I have a parting tool, which is very much a specialty tool. So that one takes parting inserts. Um, so that one is unique and different. But otherwise, I stuck with the CCMT type inserts. So I try to go with this diamond shaped insert. Again, CCMT or CCGT, depending on the, the radius on the end or the sharpness. So most of my tool holders, whether it's outside turning or inside boring, are using the CCMT insert so that I, again, minimize the number of different kind of inserts I need to have on hand to go into quite a few of these holders. One exception is I did want to have a tool holder that had more turning surfaces, that had more edges to pick from. So I went with this WNMG. I purchased one WNMG tool holder. This is the only WNMG tool holder that I have is this one. And so this is the only tool holder that uses these WNMG inserts. But to me, they have an advantage because they have six insert faces on them, as opposed to the CCMT only have four and two of them require a different tool holder. So let me pause there just for a second to recap. Make sure you have some type of a goal going into planning out your tooling. So again, my goal was I knew I wanted to do the majority of my turning with indexable carbide inserts, but I really wanted to minimize the number of different inserts that I had to use. So anytime I'm looking at buying a tool holder, I want to make sure that I understand what insert it takes and not just what the initial cost is going to be. A lot of times a tool holder will come with some inserts, but that real cost comes into where am I going to get the inserts to put into that in the future? And what quality inserts maybe does it come with initially versus what quality inserts can I purchase that could go into that same tool holder in the future? Think like uh, printers and ink. A lot of times you can get a printer for super duper cheap because they know the consumable is the ink and it's those ink cartridges that can cost a lot of money in the future. So kind of the same concept when you think about tool holders and the inserts that are going to go with them in the future. All right, with that said, let's go through and take a look at some of this tooling, and then we'll talk through the inserts and where I purchased some of those on, the, on what goes with them. So when I first purchased the lathe, I ended up with this BXA-sized indexable carbide tool holder set from Precision Matthews, and it came with seven different tool holders. You can see one of them here, Precision Matthews logo on it. All seven of these tool holders hold that CCMT, that diamond-shaped insert. Now again, with this insert, you only have four surfaces. So in this particular holder, I only have two. I have this front tip, I have the back tip. If I wanna use those other two surfaces off of this not quite a perfect diamond, then I need to go to one of these other holders that is gonna hold that in there the different directions so that I can use these other two, other two edges on this carbide insert. So again, that Precision Matthew set came with that. It came with the tool holders to use them both this direction and the other way, it also came with the larger boring bar that I have that went in this boring bar holder that was part of the CXA tool set. So that was the one set that I had. And again, all of that holds standard CCMT inserts. 
So Precision Matthew supplies you with 10 aluminum inserts, 10 steel inserts with that set. And I have since purchased additional CCMT inserts and CCGT inserts from Carbide Depot online. And again, they're interchangeable and the tool holder holds those inserts quite well. In addition to that, uh, I have purchased extra holders. So again, my tool holder is actually a CXA size. And what CXA means is that these tool holders that will hold up to a three quarters of an inch tool bit, as opposed to the BXA tooling that I picked up from Precision Matthews is only five eighths inch square. But as you can see, the five eighths inch, it fits quite fine in my three quarter inch tool holders. I still have more than enough adjustment to get those on center. So again, I have right now BXA tooling inside of a CXA tool holder. It works just fine. What you can't interchange is I could not perch, I couldn't go and buy a BXA tool holder and expect that to fit on my CXA quick change tool post. If you have a CXA sized tool post, you need to make sure that any additional tool holders that you purchase match up with what your quick change tool post is. That's what the CXA, most of these additional tool holders I've been purchasing from Shars. They go on sale. They're pretty reasonably priced. You can just check Shars online. Uh, again, sometimes they have sales, discounts, coupons. Been happy with the quality of those. So most of my additional ones that didn't come with my CXA tool post have come from Shars. Okay, I am watching this video and I'm confusing myself calling everything a tool holder. So let's just try to clear some things up before we continue on. This is the quick change tool post. You typically have one of those on your lathe is all. In order to make your quick change tool post effective and to be able to change things quickly, you need a lot of these quick change tool holders. And these quick change tool holders are what are actually going to hold your variety of tooling, such as the carbide insert tool holder, your parting tools, your brazed carbide tooling, whatever you may end up purchasing. You're going to mount these tooling into your quick change tool holder so you can quickly swap them on and off of your quick change tool post. This quick change tool post comes in a variety of different sizes, AXA, BXA, CXA, and you're going to want to make sure that that is sized appropriately for your lathe. Once you have selected a quick change tool post size, you need to make sure that all of your quick change tool holders you purchase to match. So if you, in my case, I have a CXA tool post, I can only purchase CXA sized quick change tool holders. That's the dovetail size and everything else that's going to fit. After that, a lot of this tooling comes in what's called BXA or CXA sizing, talking about the size of the shank on here. But really, all you need to make sure of is any tooling that you buy is going to fit in the slot that you have in your quick change tool holders. So for me, me, CXA, I have a three quarter inch slot in there. I can use any tooling that is three quarters of an inch or less. I can even purchase a quick change tool holder that can come up to a one inch slot if I wanted to buy an oversized tool to put in there. Hopefully that clears it all up. The three of these pieces go together like a jigsaw puzzle and you need all of them in there to make it work. A quick change tool holder by itself does not cut anything. You need to put a tool holder in there or a carbide insert tool holder in there or some other type of a cutting tool into that and then mount that on. Hopefully that makes sense as you go through the rest of the video. Uh, in addition to the BXA sized carbide tool set from Precision Matthews, I also purchased their half inch threading set, internal and external threading. So I knew I wanted to be able to do some threading right away. Very reasonable priced on these. And the other thing that I like is they use a standard carbide threading insert. So I have since purchased some Iskar brand inserts from Carbide Depot to use on these and they fit on here just fine. These are actually half inch size. So what uh, Precision Matthews had available for internal and external threading was a half inch size tool holder. Again, you can see that this half inch tool holder fits quite fine in that three quarter inch slot. I still have enough adjustment with my CXA tool post to get this half inch tool on center. You can grab lots of different things in there. You're not limited by the size of the tooling. This would be you know, smaller tooling than if, if you were to look online somewhere, it appears that this is smaller tooling that is supposed to go with the CXA, but it works just fine. You can still get it on center. So those came from Precision Matthews. It had this half inch boring bar, the half inch tool holder for internal and external threading. When I purchased that CXA quick change tool post, it comes with this parting blade holder. I just went on amazon.com and found the right size parting tool. So for a CXA, 
It's a three quarter inch wide piece of high speed steel that I put in here. You can use that. I was just actually doing a small snap ring groove. So that's sharpened up really, really narrow on the end there for that snap ring groove that I was cutting. But it's nice to be able to have a piece of high speed steel for parting. I can also sharpen this up for different things. So those were very, very reasonably priced to pick up some high speed steel parting blades. And those fit in that CXA tool holder that came with my kit. In addition to that, I wanted a little better quality parting tool. So I did purchase this Iskar parting tool blade. Again, I purchased that from Carbide Depot. This one is a SGFH32-2, or part number on it is 6309972, self-grip. Uh, Iskar, pretty good brand when it comes to threading inserts and uh, parting inserts. So the blade is Iskar brand, so it was pretty pricey. The inserts, good quality, they're a little bit expensive. I did not actually purchase the Iskar holder for this parting blade. For that, I went back to Shars and what would have been, I think, $146 or $176 to purchase this blade holder. Uh, I was able to purchase the same thing for, I believe, $25 or $30 from Shars, and it holds the blade, in my opinion, very, very well. And I'm still using a quality parting tool, quality inserts. I just have a lower priced holder to hold that. And then I'm holding that holder in one of my regular CXA tool holders for my quick change tool post. So that's how that combination goes together for parting. The knurling tool came with, again, came with my CXA tool post. When I purchased that CXA quick change tool post, it came with uh, six different holders. It came with the boring bar holder, this knurling tool holder, the parting tool holder, and three other tool holders that it came with. What I found was that the knurling wheels on the, the one that it came with, the knurling wheels were not very good quality. I tried to knurl something once with those and they did not work. I just ended up, actually had a set of knurling wheels already from 25 or 30 years ago, found them in my toolbox. I put those other knurling wheels on and they work much, much better. So even if you're not happy with the quality of knurl you're getting, maybe with the, the tools that came with your quick change tool post, you might be able to buy just a new set of knurling rollers for much less expensive than buying a whole nother knurling hit. Last, I don't do everything with indexable inserts. Uh, I still do some brazed carbide cutting. Sometimes you want a little bit less radius. Sometimes you want a sharper tool. Sometimes, you know, you still want to, to thread with one. Uh, I had another one here where I rounded it off a nice radius for a radiusing, radiusing tool. So there's still a lot of variety that you can get from brazed carbide. So I have one of my tool holders that I don't have a, an insert in, and I just use that for putting in my brazed tooling. I happened to buy these three quarter inch size ones because they were big and wanted to have some, some big ones. Um, I need to buy some half inch. Sometimes sharpening these is a little bit cumbersome. It's a lot of material to remove and having some half inch carbide tooling would really help. Makes it a little bit quicker and easier to sharpen those tools up when they're a little bit smaller than that. So those are all the tool holders. And then of course, with that comes all of the inserts. As you can see, this is my whole insert pile. So I try to keep it pretty small by not having too many different types of inserts required. So I have CCMT inserts for steel. I have CCGT, which are just a little bit of a, a sharper edge on them. They're the, the same shape, uh, same size, same nose radius. They just have, or sorry, a little bit different nose radius. They have a sharper point on them. I have the, the inserts for my parting tool have threading inserts for internal and external. It is a different insert for internal and external. So I've got a few extras of those. And then I have those WNMG inserts. So as I mentioned, with the WNMG, you're able to get three cutting surfaces on this side of the insert. You can flip it over and you get three cutting surfaces on the other side of the insert. So I get six sharp surfaces out of this insert and it actually costs very similar in price to the CCMT. Six cutting edges for the same price as, because of the, the way this is designed, it only goes one way. All of the, the rake or the relief angle and everything is built into the insert and not built into the tool holder. So it only works with this side up. So you have two cutting surfaces across that direction and then two cutting surfaces in a different tool holder across that direction. So you only get four cutting surfaces on this one instead of six, and even these four, it's across two different holders. So if you're roughing and machining apart, you can't turn it four times. You can only turn it twice before you have to get a new insert, but you can go put it in another tool holder to use the other two edges. 
So that is why I like, if I'm roughing, if I'm removing a lot of material, I really like that WNMG tool holder and the six surfaces that I have on that. And that was why I purchased it. If you look on my other videos, you see the videos where I'm making those uh, two wheel hubs. I mean, I took 112 pounds of material and made two 10 pound parts. So I think I made, like I say, 70 pounds of chips on that project. And that WNMG tool is the one that did most of that. I had extra cutting surfaces, so just saved me money on that job and not having to put use as many inserts to go through and do that whole project. Last thing, when you're looking at your carbide insert tools, you know, they do come with, a lot of the times they'll come with spare screws. If they don't, it's a good idea to have one. You want to make sure you've got some spare screws. There's nothing worse than you're in the middle of a project and, you know, either you drop a screw or you misplace one. Uh, if you break one, that may be a different issue. Then you have to worry about removing it. But sometimes you can just drop it and lose it. Uh, they're Usually when you order a new tool holder, uh, ordering some screws to go with it is one of the options there as well. I think the only other one I didn't show was on this, again, this little boring bar. This smaller boring bar, just because of the size, uh, it's not able to hold that regular CCMT, that full-size CCMT insert. All right, I know we went through a lot there and we didn't even get into all of the details of the numbering and lettering code that goes with all of these different carbide inserts. I will say that I keep mentioning CCMT and I did mention that I have one boring bar that takes a smaller size. They are still CCMT inserts, but CCMT inserts come in three different sizes. They come in a 40 series, 30 series, and a 20 series. So most of my tooling is CCMT and it's in that 30 series, 300 series. And that one smaller boring bar is still a CCMT, still the same shape of insert, but it's in the 20 series. So it is a smaller size diamond. Again, there is, you can look up a chart. I am by no means an expert on all of the letter and number nomenclature that goes with inserts. I'm relatively comfortable and familiar with the three main different ones that I have here. I have a couple of different inserts for some of the tooling on my milling machine as well. But again, to keep costs down, I really try to minimize the number of different inserts types that I have and that I keep on hand. Last thing I've got on the bench here that we didn't cover yet was the lathe files. So I would recommend that you have at least a couple of lathe files on hand. The biggest difference with the lathe file is it's a little bit uh, different angle than a regular file and it does not have an edge or doesn't have any uh, filing teeth on this edge. So that when you're in there, uh, less likely to bump into something and interfere with another part of your piece. But it is just really nice to have a lathe file handy to touch up a corner, just clean up a radius a little bit, take off, knock off a burr or a sharp edge. Would recommend you have a couple of lathe files. I like Nicholson files, so I pick these up off Amazon. Again, there's lots of different options out there. I'm sure I happen to be partial to Nicholson files. All right, I think we covered everything we planned to. We went through the headstock, we went through the tailstock items, and we went through our different uh, cutting tool items. Well, YouTube, once again, thanks for tuning in to another Blades to Be video as we did a bit of a tour of the shop here today and really went into some detail on some lathe tooling. I hope you found some tips, found some ideas, and if you are trying to put together a new setup, you're getting a new lathe, hopefully this will give you some ideas of how to think that through and just understanding what everything you may need, depending on the projects you have in mind and what you have planned to do with your lathe. So as always, enjoyed sharing some information with you. Hope you found some value in it. If you did, please leave a comment, leave a like on the channel. Uh, if you've got any suggestions, love to see those in the comments as well. And look forward to putting more videos out for you. Subscribe, ring that bell, and that way you'll make sure you know when the next video is going to be out there. If you don't ring the bell, just look for them on Saturday mornings. That's what I'm shooting for right now is to get a video out there on a Saturday morning. So as you get up and you're having that first cup of coffee before you head out to your shop, you can check out what's been going on in the Blades to Be shop that week. Look forward to seeing you next time. I hope you're making some chips on your own and working on some fabulous projects. And we'll see you soon. Take care.